We've now finished up our first little application using Docker. We're now going to start working on our second application, which is going to be a little bit more complicated in nature, and it's going to require us to learn some more advanced features around Docker. Let's first take a look at a mock-up of what we're going to build. All right, so here it is. This is really a classic example of Docker in action. You're going to find a lot of other applications out there that are very similar in nature. So the purpose of this tiny little application is to make a Docker container that contains a web application that simply displays inside the browser the number of times that, this per that someone essentially has visited this server. And so you can see right now it says number of visits 10. That indicates that this page has been visited 10 times. Now in order to build this, we're going to need two separate components. First off, we're going to need some type of web server, something to actually respond to HTTP requests and generate some HTML to show inside the browser. To actually store the number of times that this thing has been visited, we're going to also make use of a little Redis server. Remember, Redis is an in-memory data store. You can essentially think of it as a tiny little database that sits entirely inside of memory. The only purpose of the Redis server is going to be to contain the number of times that the page has been visited. Now, something to be aware of here, yes, we absolutely could store this number of visits inside the node application itself. That's totally an option. However, just to make this thing a little bit more kind of sufficiently complicated, we are going to be making use of Redis. Now, I want to think a little bit about how we're going to generally architecture this app using Docker. Now, your first kind of impression here, or maybe your first guess, might be that we're going to make a single container, and inside that single container, we could run both our Node application and a Redis server. Now, don't get me wrong, this is totally possible. You could take this approach right here. However, if this application ever got popular to any degree, it would start to have some issues. Let me tell you what the issue would be. Let's imagine that you start getting a lot of traffic to this little, somewhat useless website that you've put together. As you start to get more and more traffic, you're probably going to want to introduce more web application servers to respond to incoming HTTP requests. And so in order to make additional servers, you might create additional instances of your Docker container that contains both the node application and an instance of Redis. The issue with this approach is that every one of these different Redis servers would be completely disconnected from each other. And so one server, one Redis instance over here inside this Docker container might think that the page has been visited 99 times, but then some other Redis instance in another container might think that it's only been visited three times. So in general, we would definitely not want to create multiple instances of a Redis instance for a single app. Instead, we would want to have one single instance. And then if we need to scale up the web application itself, we could just scale the node server and make additional instances of the node server. So essentially what we're going to do is we have something that looks a little bit more like this. We were, are gonna have separate Docker containers for both the node application and the Redis server. Each of the Docker containers that holds the node app will connect somehow over to the Redis instance in this separate container and store the current count or current visit variable inside of that Redis server instead. Now for the first iteration of this project, we're not going to worry about scaling just yet. So we're really going to be setting up something that looks like this right here. We've got one Docker container that contains our node app, and then a second container that has just the Redis server inside of it. So with that in mind, let's take a quick break right here. We're going to come back to the next section and we're going to start writing out the code for our node application. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're going to write out all the JavaScript code required to implement this node application. Now, remember, if you're here in this course without a background in Node, or maybe you're not interested in JavaScript at all, that's totally fine. You can skip this section and go to the next section where I've put all the code that we're going to write right now up, then you can just copy paste it over very easily. So again, if you don't want to write out a bunch of JavaScript, just continue into the next section. Otherwise, stick around and we'll get started right now. All right, so to get started, I'm going to flip back over to my terminal. You'll notice that I'm again in a workspace directory of sorts, so I'm no longer inside that web directory that we were working in earlier. Inside of here, we're going to make a new project folder, and I'm going to call it, how about just visits, like so, because that's what this application is doing. It's counting some number of visits. I'm then going to change into that directory, and then I'll open up my code editor inside there. 
Now we're going to create two separate files very similarly to what we did on the last application we worked on. We're going to have a package.json file that's going to record all the dependencies of our application, and then we're going to have an index.js file, which will serve as the actual node server. Let's first make the package.json file. So inside of my root project directory, I'll make a new file called package.json. And then inside of here, we're going to specify some number of dependencies and a scripts section as well. So first we'll do our dependencies. Don't forget that we are going to use double quotes everywhere inside this file. We're going to pull in express, and I don't really care what version of express we use, so I'll put an asterisk. And then we're also going to get a second dependency that we did not use previously called Redis. Now, this Redis dependency right here is a JavaScript client library for connecting to a Redis server. So this library right here is how we are going to somehow kind of connect over to our running Redis server and pull information from it and update information inside of it as well. Now for the Redis library, we are going to use a specific version. We're going to get 2.8.0. So that's the two dependencies we're going to need. I'm going to put a comma in, and then we're going to add on a scripts section as well. And very much like we had last time, We'll have a single start script, and anytime we run that, it will actually execute node index.js. All right, so that's it for our package.json file. I'm now going to make a second file that's going to be our index.js file, and that's going to hold all of our actual application code. So I'm going to make a separate file called index.js. And at the top, we're going to require in two separate libraries. We're going to get express again. And then we're also going to import that Redis library that we just added as a dependency. We'll then make a new instance of an Express application. And at the same time, we're also going to set up a connection to our Redis server. So I'll say const client. So client right here is going to represent our connection over to the Redis server. And we'll say redis.createClient, like so. Now we're going to come back and add in a little bit more information to this create client function call right here. We're going to eventually specify the host or like the URL or the address of the Redis server that we're trying to connect to and its port as well. But that's going to be a part of a little bit of conversation that we'll have down the road once we start to actually put together the Docker side of this application. After that, we'll add in a route handler for our root route. We'll say anytime that someone comes to the root route of our application, we're going to call this callback function. Now inside of here, we're going to attempt to use this client connection over to the Redis server to get the current number of times that our page has been visited. So to do so, I'll say client.get visits. And then as a second argument, we'll add in a callback that gets called with a possible error object and the number of visits that are stored inside of Redis. And then we'll send a response back to whoever made this original request. We'll just say number of visits is, and then we'll add on through some simple string concatenation, visits, like so. After doing so, after sending this response back to the user, we'll make sure that we also update the number of times that this page has been visited. And so to do so, we're going to again reference our client object. I'll say client.set visits is going to be visits plus one. Now a little bit of a gotcha here, this visits variable that we get back from Redis is actually going to come back to us as a string rather than the integer that we would really expect it to be. And so just to make sure that we add one to an integer and not a string, I'm going to wrap this with a parse int function call. Then the last thing we need to do is add on a app.listen. We'll again use port 8081. And then once the application successfully starts listening, we'll do a console log that says listening on port 8081. Now one last very quick thing that we need to do inside of here. You'll notice that we're kind of assuming that the instant our server starts up, we've already got some number of visits stored, or like there's some existing initial value for visits. 
that's probably not the case. So one thing that we'll do right after we start up our client right here, we'll make sure that we do a client.set visits to zero. So this right here is going to initialize our number of visits to be zero. And then every time that a user comes to our root route, we'll pull that number out and then increment it by one and store it back on the Rivis side. Okay, so that's it for this file. That's all the application code that we need to write with the exception of a little bit of networking stuff that we're gonna put inside of here to make sure that we connect to our Redis server. So let's take a quick break right here. We'll continue in the next section and we're going to continue working on our Docker setup. In the last section, we wrote out all of our application code for the Node.js server. Now that we've got all that stuff put together, we're going to put together a little Docker file that's gonna be basically identical to the one that we had put together previously. This Docker file's sole purpose is going to be to put together this Node application. And so essentially it's representing this side of the equation. This Docker file is gonna have nothing to do whatsoever with our Redis server. So it's solely concerned with the Node app for now. So let's get started on this. Inside of my code editor, I'll find my visits folder Inside there, I'll make a Docker file. Then inside of here, we're going to again see some code that's very identical to what we put together on our last application. We'll first specify our base image as node alpine. We'll then set up a working directory. We'll again use app as a working directory. And then remember, we're going to use a little strategy to make sure that we only try to rebuild the image anytime that we change the package.json file. And we won't rebuild the image if we make any changes to the source code, like in the index.js file. To make sure that's the case, we're going to first copy over only the package.json file. We'll then run npm install to get all of our different dependencies. And then we'll copy over all of the rest of our source code with copy dot dot. And then finally, we'll start up our server with cmd npm start, like so. Okay, so again, basically the same thing as what we wrote previously. Let's now flip over to our terminal and try building a image out of this Docker file. So I'll go back over to my terminal. I'm going to make sure I'm inside of my visits directory and I'll run docker build dot. We're then gonna see the familiar steps. You might see that red text again, something that says uh, notice right there, and you might see the three warnings. Those are totally fine. You can completely ignore those. So then down here at the bottom, we see the ID of the image that was created. Now, chances are we might not be making a tremendous number of changes to this image. So I think we should go ahead and just tag this image with a name right now, or give it some name, so that we don't have to keep carrying around this ID all the time. So let's rerun that docker build command, but rather than putting a dot right at the end, we'll say docker build, and then we will dash T to tag it. And I'll put in my name or my Docker username that is, slash the name of our project, which is visits. And then I'll put a tag on it by indicating the little colon with latest. And then after that, I'll put the period to indicate that we want to build out of the current directory. All right, so there we go, that's it. We've now got our tagged Docker image. So let's take a quick break right here and we'll come back to the next section and we'll start getting a better sense of how to get this thing to work along together with a separate container that's running Redis. In the last section, we created our Docker file and built a new image for our new application. We should now be able to start up our application by running Docker run, and then we'll specify the image we just created. So you will put in your Docker username slash visits. Now remember, you do not have to specify the tag by putting on colon, uh, colon latest at the end, but you optionally can if you want to. So we can run this right here and it will start up our application. Now you'll notice that we immediately get an error message. It says Redis connection to something, something, something failed. So our application is attempting to start up, but there's no Redis server running for it to connect to. So in this section, we're gonna focus on getting a separate container running a Redis server. Now, as far as getting up a separate Redis server goes, well, it's gonna be pretty darn straightforward. We're gonna run the same exact command that we've ran throughout this course. I'll run docker run Redis, like so. 
And so that's going to reach out to the Docker Hub. It's going to pull down the Redis instance, and it'll start up a copy of Redis on our local machine. And boom, just like that, there's our Redis server. So that's it. That's the Redis instance we're going to use. No customization to the Docker image for it whatsoever. So now that we have our Docker, or excuse me, our Redis server running, I'm going to open up a second terminal window. And inside the second window, I'll now try running Docker run my image again. So I'll say Docker run Steven Greider slash visits. Let's run that. And you'll notice, well, it looks like we still have the same error message we had before, even though we are now running a Redis server inside of a separate container. So what's the problem? Well, let's think about it for a second. Here's what's going on on your computer right now. You've got a node application in one container and the Redis application in the separate Docker container. Now, these two containers do not have any automatic communication between the two whatsoever. They are two absolutely isolated processes that don't have any communication. So in order to make sure that our node app has the ability to kind of reach out to the Redis server and store information or work with it in some fashion, we need to set up some networking infrastructure between the two. And when it comes to setting up some networking functionality between two separate containers, we have for right now, two options to look at. So here's our two options. We can either make use of the Docker CLI that we've been making use of throughout this course so far. You know, I'm talking about the Docker command that we've been using at our terminal throughout this entire course. This built-in Docker CLI has functionality tied to it that will allow us to set up a network between two separate containers. However, there's a little issue with it. And the issue is basically just that it's a real pain in the neck to do. When you make use of Docker CLI to set up some networking, it's going to involve a handful of different commands that have to be reran every single time you start up your different containers. Now, of course, we could make some type of little script to run all that stuff for us, but you know, certainly it's going to involve a lot of typing and a lot of thought on how we're going to set up all this networking stuff. I'm going to be honest with you, I have just about never seen people in industry ever making use of Docker's built-in the Docker CLI, let me be very clear here, never making use of Docker CLI's built-in networking features to connect two containers together. Much more frequently, what you're going to see and what you and I are going to do inside this course is we're going to make use of a separate CLI tool called Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a separate tool that gets installed along with Docker. So if you right now flip back over to your terminal and run docker-compose like so, you should see some content appear on the screen and we'll list out a series of different commands for you to run. Docker Compose is a separate CLI. It's already installed on your machine. Now, when you start introducing Docker Compose, it's gonna very quickly start getting confusing what Docker Compose does and what Docker CLI does and what the relationship between the two is. So the best thing I could tell you is that Docker Compose really exists to keep you from having to write out a ton of different repetitive commands with the Docker CLI. So throughout this course, we've been running stuff like Docker run and Docker attach and exec, and we've been specifying ports and tags and all this stuff just all the time. Now, definitely as we learn this stuff, you know, we need to use Docker CLI and learn it. But at a certain point in time, you say, okay, you know, I understand this Docker CLI stuff and you get tired of writing out those commands. And so one of the big purposes of Docker Compose is to just avoid having to write out all these really annoying tiny little options every time you want to start up a container. The other big thing that Docker Compose is going to do for us is it's going to make it very easy and very straightforward to start up multiple Docker containers at the same time and automatically connect them together with some form of networking. And it's all going to happen behind the scenes for us quite automatically. So again, as soon as you start seeing this terminology here of Docker Compose, you know, keeping the, all these Docker terms straight in your head gets a little bit confusing, but I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to repeat it several times. The purpose of Docker Compose is to essentially function as Docker CLI, but allow you to kind of issue multiple commands much more quickly. So let's take a quick break right here. We're going to come back to the next section, and we're going to get a little bit more familiar with Docker Compose and how it works. In the last section, we spoke about how we're going to use Docker Compose to automate some of the commands that we were previously writing our long form using Docker CLI. The big purpose of Docker Compose is not only to automate some of these long-winded commands, it's also to make sure that we have the ability to easily start up multiple Docker containers at the same time and connect them together in some automated fashion. Now, to make use of Docker Compose, 
we're essentially going to take the same commands that we were running before, like docker build and docker run, but we're going to kind of encode these commands into a very special file in our project directory called docker-compose.yaml. Now to be really clear, we're not just going to like copy paste these into the file. We're going to write out these commands more or less in a special syntax inside the YAML file. Once we create that file, we'll then feed it into the Docker Compose CLI, and it will be up to the CLI to parse that file and create all the different containers with the correct configuration that we specified. Now the Docker Compose file can sometimes be a little bit complicated, so I'm gonna give you a quick preview of what we're going to do inside of it. So here's essentially what we're gonna write into that file. We're going to first start off by saying, hey, Docker Compose, we've got a couple containers that we want you to create. In total, there are going to be two separate containers. One container is going to be called Redis-Server, and we want you to create that container by using the Redis image, which can be pulled down from Docker Hub. We want you to also create a second image, or excuse me, a second container called Node-App, and we want that container to be created using the Docker file in the current directory. Remember, that's the Docker file that you and I just put together two seconds ago, this one right here. In addition, after making that container, we want you to map some ports from the container to our local machine so that we can access everything running inside of it. So that's just a quick little preview because again, some of the syntax that's gonna go in here is gonna sometimes look just a little bit crazy. Let's now flip back over to our code editor and we're gonna start writing out our Docker Compose file. Okay, so back over here, inside of my root project directory, I'm gonna make a new file called Docker excuse me, docker-compose.yml. And then inside of here, we're gonna write out all that configuration. The first thing we're going to do is add in one little required line, which is gonna be a version, a colon, and then inside of a set of single quotes, three. That specifies the version of Docker Compose that we're trying to use with this formatted file that we're putting together right now. After that, We'll then put together this big block right here. So we're first going to head it off with kind of a big section header that says Docker Compose, here's what we want you to do. So to tell it, here's what we want you to do, we're gonna write out services and then put a colon down. Now you're gonna see the term services start to pop up a lot in the Docker world, especially as you start working with Docker Compose. Anytime you see the word service, it's essentially saying a container. Now to be precise, it's not quite saying like exactly a container, it's kind of saying like a type of container. So in this case, by putting down Redis server and node app, we are saying that we are defining two services inside this Docker Compose file, and both these services take the form of these two different Docker containers. Now the first service that we are going to create is going to be one that we're going to call redis-server, I'll then put down a colon after that. And then inside of here, we're gonna specify the image that we want Docker Compose to use to create this service or this container. So I'm gonna say, use the image Redis to create this service or create this container. So what you see right here is essentially accomplishing the same purpose as these three blocks right here. It's saying, we want you to create a set of containers. This one is gonna be called Redis Server and we want you to create it using the Redis image. So now we'll do something very similar for our other type of container that we're going to build. So notice I have indented a little bit right here, and we're going to create the node app service. So I'll say node-app. We want this container to be built using the Docker file inside the current directory. So rather than just specifying an image like we did right there, I'm gonna say build colon dot. And that means look in the current directory for a Docker file and use that to build this image that's gonna be used for this container. And then after that, we're gonna specify all the different ports that we want to have be opened up on this container. Now to specify the ports, we're gonna put a dash, excuse me, ports like so, and then indented, we're gonna put a dash like so. Now the reason we're putting a dash right here, the dash in a YAML file is how we specify an array. So we can technically map many different ports inside of a single Docker Compose file for a single service or a single container. But in our case, we only want to map one set of ports. So we're going to connect 8081 
on our local machine to 8081 inside the container. Now, remember the syntax here. The first number is the port on your local machine. The second is the port inside the container. So if we want to stick to the same convention that we used previously, we could do 4001 like so. You know what, let's just stick with 4001 just to keep the distinction between these new two numbers a little bit more clear. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Now let's take a quick pause right here. We're going to come back to the next section. We're going to talk a little bit how, about how we make use of this Docker Compose file to actually bring up these two containers. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our first Docker Compose file. It has two separate services, or essentially types of containers, available in it. The first is called Redis Server, and it uses the image Redis. The second is called Node App, and it uses the Docker file that we put into our current directory. So we're now going to figure out how we can take this Docker Compose file and create the two separate containers. But before we do, one quick thing I want to mention here. Remember the entire reason that we started talking about Docker Compose in the first place. We had said, oh yeah, we want to use Docker Compose because it makes networking or connecting these containers together very straightforward. But you'll notice that we have put absolutely no configuration into this file right here to kind of specify any layer of networking. So believe it or not, by just defining these two services inside this file, Docker Compose is going to automatically create both these containers on essentially the same network. And they're going to have free access to communicate to each other in any way that they please. So by just using Docker Compose to create container one and Docker container number two, the two have free access to each other and can, contain, can exchange as much information as they want without having to exchange or open up any ports between the two. So when the two containers are created using Docker Compose, we don't have to go through any like port declaration like this. This port declaration right here is solely to open up our contain access to our container on our local machine. We don't have to do any additional steps like this to connect together the two separate containers. Now, that might be great for me to say, but in reality, hey, how do we actually kind of access the Redis server from our Node.js code? Well, let's open up our index.js file and I'll show you how it's done very easily. Now, back inside of our index.js file, remember we've got that redis.createClient call right here. And I had said that we were going to eventually come back to this and add in a little bit of information about the location of the Redis server that we are running. So to specify where this Redis server is running, I'm going to put in a set of curly braces like so, and then we're going to specify a host option. Now, usually if we were not using Docker, if we were, this was just a traditional node application without any Docker stuff whatsoever, we would usually put in some type of address right here, like HTTPS, my Redis, server.com or something like that. So usually we would put in some type of connection URL right here. But since we are making use of Docker Compose, back over here, so here's our Docker Compose file, we can connect to this other container running the Redis server simply by referring to it by its name of Redis-Server. So rather than putting in some long form connection URL like this right here, we're going to delete that and we will replace it with Redis-Server. Now, one thing to be aware of here is that Node.js, Express.js, which is the kind of the framework we're using to actually render and respond to requests, and Redis itself have no idea what Redis-Server means. Redis is going to just take that string and it's going to kind of use it on good faith and say, you know what, I'm just going to assume that this is a meaningful URL. I'm going to assume that this is something like HTTPS colon slash slash my Redis server or something like that. And so Redis is just going to make a good faith, or this Redis client right here is going to make a good faith effort to connect to the server at this host name. When the connection request goes out from this node application, Docker is going to see it. It's going to see that it's trying to access a host called Redis-Server, and it's going to say, oh, I know what you're looking for. You are looking for this other container over here, the container with the name Redis-Server. And so when our node, or excuse me, our Redis client right here tries to connect to the Redis server, it's going to get automatically redirected over to this other container running our copy of Redis. Now, just to be really complete here, technically when we create the client, we can also specify a port that the Redis server is running on. By default, the port that's always used with Redis is 6379. 
And so I'm just gonna add that in there for completion's sake. But again, it is a default port number. So now when our Express application starts up or the Node application starts up, it's gonna to try to create a connection to a Redis server. It's going to reach out looking for a host name of Redis-Server. Docker is going to see that it's looking for Redis-Server and it's gonna redirect that connection over to this other running container. So that's what's going to automatically connect together these two containers and get them to communicate together in some fashion. Okay, so that's it. Let's take another quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and we're gonna figure out how we're going to actually start all of our different containers with this Docker Compose file. In the last section, we spoke about how Docker Compose automatically sets up some networking between these different services or these different types of containers that we define inside of our Docker Compose file. Now that all this stuff is supposedly set up, let's figure out how to start up Docker Compose using this file. All right, so remember the entire purpose, or well, I should say one of the purposes of Docker Compose is to kind of make it easier to run all the different commands that you usually run with Docker Run. So whereas before we would start up a new instance of a container using Docker Run and then the name of the image that we wanted to create the container out of, to create a instance of all the containers or all the images or all the services listed inside of our compose file, we're going to run the command docker-compose up. Now that one's pretty straightforward. So essentially instead of saying run, we're gonna say up and we don't have to specify an image. We're not specifying an image because Docker Compose is going to look into our current working directory and automatically look for a docker-compose file inside there. Now the thing to be aware of is that before we had the two separate Docker commands to build an image and run it. So if we wanted to rebuild the image from our Docker file and then start an instance of it, two separate commands. But in the Docker Compose world, if we ever want to rebuild the images that are listed inside of our Docker Compose file, for example, if we wanted to have Docker Compose rebuild this container right here or the image used for that container, we write Docker Compose up dash dash build. And so this dash dash build right here is what essentially tells Docker Compose, start up our containers again, but make sure you try to rebuild them ahead of time so that we get all the latest changes. Okay, so let's give this a shot. I'm gonna flip on over to my terminal. I'm inside of my project directory and I can definitely verify that I have my docker-compose file inside of here. So I'm going to run docker-compose up. Now I want you to take a look at the very first line right here. The very first line says creating network visits underscore default. So like I said before, when you just create a new set of containers or services with Docker Compose, it's going to automatically make a network for you that's going to join those different containers together. After that, we can see that it is creating an image for our node application. And then if we scroll down a little bit more, we're gonna see a whole bunch of different output down here. The most important lines to see are creating visits node app one, so that's a single instance of our node-app service. And then we've got a single instance of our Redis server as well. After that, we'll then start to see all the output from both of those different services start to appear. So every line here that's appearing in yellow for me is output from the Redis server. And if I scroll down a little bit more, I'll eventually see some output from the node application. So it looks like based on ready to accept connections right here and listening on port 8081 right here, definitely looks like both of our containers set up were created successfully. So let's open up our browser. We're gonna to try to open up our node application and see if the entire app works. All right, so I'm gonna open up localhost 4001. Remember, we made that kind of last minute change there. We had hard coded to say port 8081, but at the last minute we decided to change the port used to 4001. So make sure you're going to localhost colon 4001. And then sure enough, we see number of visits is zero. And then we can refresh. And every time that we refresh the page, we'll see that number of visits start to increment. Awesome. So that's a basic usage of Docker Compose. We created two separate services and Docker Compose automatically made connections between the two available. The real key thing to keep in mind here is that in order to communicate between the two, we used a host name of the name of that other service or that other container that was created. And that name is specified inside of our Docker Compose file right here. So anytime you are making use of maybe some database driver inside of your 
web application layer, anywhere you would normally put in a connection URL or connection URI, you can instead just list the name of that other container and the host name will be automatically resolved for you by Docker. All right, now quick break. There's still one or two quick things I want to go over on Docker Compose. So I'll see you in just a minute. The running theme that we have seen with Docker Compose is that it makes it a lot easier to work with multiple containers at the same time. In this section, we're going to take a look at two different commands that we had previously used with Docker CLI and get a sense of how to run them with Docker Compose instead. So the two commands we're going to look at, well, just the first one for right now. We'll get, move on to the second one in just a moment. I want you to recall that in the past, we executed a or created a container by running docker run dash d and then the name of an image, like say Redis. This started up a new container, but it executed it in the background. So we could continue running commands in this terminal window if we wanted to. We could then get a printout of all of our running containers with docker ps. So there's the container I just created. And I could then stop that container by copying the ID and executing docker stop and pasting the ID. Now you can kind of imagine that when we start using Docker Compose and we're working with multiple images at, or multiple containers at the same time, it would really be a pain to have to run Docker stop with each different ID for each container we started. So with Docker Compose, we can automatically start up multiple containers in the background at the same time and then close them all at the same time with one single command. So here's how we do it. To start up a group of containers in the background, using that dash D flag before, like we did with Docker CLI, we can run Docker Compose up and then dash D on the very end. We can then stop all of our running containers with Docker Compose down. And easy way to remember down right here is that, hey, Docker Compose up, the opposite of going up is going down. So let's try this out. Still inside of my visits directory, I'll run Docker Compose up dash D that's going to start up both of my containers in the background so I can continue running other commands here. I can do a docker ps that'll show our two running containers and then to stop both of them at the same time we can do a docker compose down like so. And when I run that it's going to stop and then remove the two containers we had created. So if I do another docker ps nope nothing's here anymore. All right so that's pretty much it. Again, there's a lot of commands from the Docker CLI world that have kind of a one-to-one -one translation over to Docker Compose. So let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue looking at a couple other commands in the next section. One thing that we have not discussed in the Docker world just yet is how to deal with containers that crash for some given reason. So it's entirely possible that you and I might be running a server of some sort inside of a container and maybe that server experiences some error that caused it to hang or crash. In this section, we're going to start taking a look at a couple of different ways that we can mitigate that behavior and figure out how to essentially restart a container when the software inside of it has an error of some sort. To get started, we're going to first add in a little bit of code to our index.js file to make sure that our server crashes entirely anytime someone visits our root route. So we're going to add in kind of a arbitrary forced crash to this thing and then figure out how to deal with it using Docker Compose. So to get started, inside of my index.js file, I'm going to add in a third require statement here at the top. So I'm going to say const process is require process. And then to make sure that my server crashes anytime someone tries to access the root route, I'll find the root route handler right here. I'll add a new line inside the function body and I'll say process.exit zero, like so. Now I'll talk about why we are passing in the zero right there in just a moment. But first, let's test this out and make sure that we can actually get our server to crash any time that we try to visit this root route. So I'm going to flip on over to my terminal and I'll run docker compose up. And since we just made a little change to the code inside one of our images, I'm going to add on the dash dash build flag to make sure that we attempt to rebuild that container. So I'll run that, we're going to rebuild that container, and then everything starts up. And I see my running Redis server, and I'm also listening on port 8081, but you and I know that we actually changed the listening port to 4001 inside of our Docker Compose file right here. All right, so I'm going to now open up my web browser. 
and I'm going to navigate to localhost colon 4001. Once I navigate over there, I'm going to see an error message like this appear on the screen. And if I flip back over to my terminal, you'll notice that it says right here, we exited with code zero. And so at this point, essentially our running container and the software inside of it has crashed. I now want you to try opening up a second tab and running Docker PS. When we do so, you'll notice that we are now down to just one running container, just the Redis container, and our node server is no longer running whatsoever. So clearly that, clearly that thing has crashed and we might want to automatically restart it at some point in time. So let's take a quick pause right here and take a look at what our different options are in the next section. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started taking a look at how we can get Docker Compose to automatically maintain and restart our containers. We added in a little bit of code to our node server to make sure that anytime we visited our root route, the server would automatically exit. When we visited that route, we were then able to flip on over to our terminal and see that our container stopped. We were also able to run Docker PS and verify that, yep, we only have one container now running. So in this section, we're going to figure out exactly how we can get Docker Compose to automatically restart that crashed or stopped container. Now, the first thing I want to tell you about is that little line of code that we added inside of our index.js file. Inside of here, we added in process.exit and passed in the number zero right there. The zero that we're adding in right there is what we refer to as a exit status code. By adding in a zero, we are indicating that we just exited our node server and we exited because we wanted to. Everything is okay. We didn't run into any errors. We stopped that running process because we meant to. If we added in a status code of anything besides zero, so one, two, three, 300, 400, 500, 5,000, any number besides zero, that means that our running process exited because an error occurred or something went wrong. Now that's a very important little tidbit to be aware of because it's going to affect exactly how Docker decides whether or not to restart our containers. So just keep that in your mind for just a moment. Okay, so here's how we're going to get Docker Compose to automatically restart a container. We're going to specify something called a restart policy inside of our Docker Compose file. There are four different restart policies that we have access to. By default, we have the no restart policy assigned to all of our containers. The no restart policy means if this thing crashes for any reason, do not attempt to restart the container. We also get the always restart policy, which as you might guess, means if the container stops for absolutely any reason whatsoever, automatically attempt to restart it. We get two others that we'll talk about in just a moment, but before we do, let's try adding in the always restart policy to our node server and then try visiting it again and trying to get it to crash. So let's get to it. I'm gonna flip back over to my code editor I'm going to open up my Docker Compose file, and then I'm going to add a new line right after our node app specification right here. I'm going to say restart always. So as you might guess, this specifies the always restart policy for our node app container. Notice how we specified a restart policy for one specific service or one specific server, excuse me, container. If we wanted to add a restart policy to the Redis server, we would have to add it onto that one specifically as well. But for right now, we'll go with just node app. Now I'm gonna save this file and we're gonna try bringing up our Docker Compose containers again and seeing what happens when our node application crashes. Okay, so I'm gonna flip back over to my terminal. I'm going to hit Control C to stop that node, comp or excuse me, Docker Compose process. And then I will start them back up with Docker Compose up. We'll now flip open our browser again. I'll open a new tab. I do encourage you to make a new tab here as opposed to just refreshing the existing one you have. Sometimes Chrome does not quite refresh the server as you would expect if you reuse your tab. So I'm going to visit localhost colon 4001 again. I get the error message here, which is okay. If I flip back over to my terminal, after a second or two, you'll notice that we have gotten that exit message right there. But then very quickly after that, we got this new color here that essentially means that we just restarted that running container. So we've restarted the container and we are again have a copy of Node.js listing on port 81 inside the container. One thing that's kind of interesting here is that you'll notice that we are seeing multiple listening on port 81, 8081 messages here. 
That's totally fine. Technically, when you and I are stopping our container with that process.exit line, we're not actually deleting the container or stopping it or anything like, or killing it or anything like that. Technically, the container just stopping. And when Docker Compose decides to restart the container, it's reusing the one that we had previously created. And so when we reuse that container, we attach to the standard out log, which has all the previous messages appended on it as well. And that's why we're seeing multiple listing on port 8081s right here. All right, so back over to our diagrams. So as you might guess, the always restart policy says, hey, if this container stops for any reason, just go ahead and attempt to restart it. And we just saw that in action when we crashed our server. Now we also get access to the on failure restart policy. As you might guess, the on failure policy is only going to attempt to restart the running container if we get a error code. So a status code from that process.exit line other than zero. Let's try testing that out right now and just seeing what happens. Now I'm going to leave process.exit inside of index.js as zero right here. Okay, so we're still going to have an exit code of zero, which means we exited because we wanted to. But inside of my Docker compose file, I'm going to change the restart policy to be on dash failure, like so. Now I'll go back over to my terminal. I'll stop that running process with control C. I'll then start my Docker Compose group back up with Docker Compose up. Now if I open up my browser again, I'll again create a new tab and visit localhost 4001. I don't get any feedback here. If I go to my terminal, I'll see that I have an exit with status code zero. And now in this case, we say that, hey, we exited because we wanted to, no error whatsoever. But we specified a restart policy that says only attempt to restart it if we had a failure. So in this case, we're never going to see the container restart. We would have to change our exit code in order to see it restarted when using the on failure policy. Now, if you want to test that out yourself, feel free to do so. You could change the exit of zero right here to one or 10 or 100 or essentially any non-zero number. Just remember that if you do that, you will, re have to, you will have to rebuild your image by using docker compose up dash dash build like so. So again, if you want to try it yourself, just don't forget the dash dash build. Now, the last policy that I want to tell you about is the unless stopped policy. So unless stopped means always attempt to restart this container unless you or I at the command line forcibly tell that container to stop by running docker stop. So unless stopped right here basically means just always restart it, but if you and I really want it to stop, then it will stop. Now, one quick note here about the no restart policy. You'll notice that in this case, we put quotes around no. That's actually on purpose. So with all the other policies like always on failure and unless stopped, you can just type in the raw policy name into your Docker compose file. So on failure like that right there. But if you're going to make use of the no restart policy, you specifically have to put it in quotes, either double or single. The reason for that is that in a YAML file, the value no, and you can see when I type it in, it appears as orange right here. So in a YAML file, the value no gets interpreted as false. So a false restart policy is different than a string of no. So that's why no specifically needs to be added in quotes so that it understands this is not a Boolean false, it's specifically the string no. Okay, so that's pretty much it on restart policies. Now, the last thing you might be a little bit curious about is why would we ever want to use always versus on failure? Well, it really comes down to the purpose of your Docker container. In some cases, you might have a container that you always, always, always want to make sure is running. A good example of this would be a web server. If you are running some public web application, chances are 100% of the time you want that server to be available. And so if you are running some type of web application, well, I would kind of expect you to use the always restart policy so that you are at least always attempting to keep your server running. On the other hand, if you are running some type of worker process, like some container that is meant to do some amount of processing on some file and then naturally exit, that would probably be a good use case for the on failure policy because that worker container might eventually finish its job. It might finish processing a file. And when it's completed processing that file, well, you probably don't want to start it back up because it finished its job and you should probably just let it die and let it close out and not get restarted. 
And so if you have a worker process of some sort, well, that's probably where I would expect you to use the on failure policy. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That's how we get Docker Compose to automatically maintain our containers. Now there's one last little note that I wanna share around Docker Compose. So let's take a quick break right here and continue in the next section. In this section, there's just one last very quick command around Docker Compose that I want you to be aware of. At this point, we've seen several times that we can start up a running container with the Docker CLI directly. And then we can, in a second window, run Docker PS and get the status of all the running containers that we have. Now a very similar command exists for Docker Compose as well. So if I stop that running container and then bring up my two different containers using Docker Compose, I can then print out the status of both of those containers by using Docker Compose PS. So again, same thing as the Docker CLI, just for Docker Compose. So I've got my two running containers here. I'll open up a second window and then I'll do docker-compose ps. And that's gonna print out the status of the two containers inside of my Docker Compose file. Now, when I say that right there, the two running containers inside of my Docker Compose file, this is something I wanna make sure is really clear. When I ran Docker Compose ps right here, I ran it from the same directory as my docker compose.yaml file. When you run Docker ps, it's going to specifically look for a Docker Compose file inside of your current directory. And if it finds one, it'll read that file, and then it will try to find all of the running containers on your local machine that belong essentially to this Docker Compose file. If you try running the Docker Compose PS command from any other directory, you're going to get an error message that says, hey, I know you want to get the status of containers, but which containers? Docker Compose is not going to just kind of magically figure out which containers you're talking about. It needs that Docker Compose YAML file as kind of a reference to understand which specific containers it's proposed to get the status of. So as a very quick example, I encourage you to go up one directory. So now inside this folder, I do not have a Docker Compose file. And so inside of here, if I run Docker Compose PS, I'm gonna get an error message that says, hey, sorry, but I have no idea what containers you're talking about. So just remember with a lot of these Docker Compose commands, you need to run it the commands from the appropriate directory. All right, so that is pretty much it on Docker Compose right now. So let's take another quick break and we'll continue in the next section.